Lawson, the podcast for law firms, powered by Consult Webs. Welcome back to Lawson, the only podcast for law firms that runs in place to keep from walking off the map. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest in legal marketing and law firm development. I'm Jake Sanders. He's Paul Julius. Paul, what are we running from today? Today, hmm. And so yesterday was responsibility, and the day before that was uh, financial obligations. So I think today is just, I'm just going to say reality. Let's just run away from reality. I'm going to say that reality has been institutionalized to seem systemic in a way that we can't quite overcome. So we run. We run away. Sometimes the reality switches, and it shows up in front of us, and then we turn around and run back. It's the nature of reality, man. That's how it goes. Physics is a weird hole to fall down, man. (laughs) (laughs) But gravity's with you the whole way down. (laughs) Until you get to the quantum level, and then it doesn't work at all. I don't get this. In another episode of this, we kept on talking. But in this episode, we're going to tell you what's on the show today uh, in this quantum reality. So let's run towards the intro. And, and That's right. In this branch of reality, we're going to be talking about creativity, developing ideas, and finishing them. First, with an article from Science Daily. And then author, lawyer, and runner David Kempston makes his return to the show to talk about his latest book and more. And due to contractual obligations, we ask him the same five questions we asked him last time with five questions we ask everyone. Pull up a plate. It's the Hot Takes Buffet. That smell you smell is the Hot Take Buffet. And <laughs> it's basically just an, an odious affair of great cooking smells. From the kitchen of sciencedaily.com. Uh, it's written from the hacks at Mount Sinai. Yep. The headline is Working Memory Positively Associated with Higher Physical Endurance, Better Cognitive Function. I don't know. I mean, if you believe that, you believe anything. The subhead is Suboptimal Cardiovascular Health Smoking is Associated with Less Cohesive Brain Networks. So, I mean, explains I, a lot. I mean, explains a lot. I've played enough late night gigs to be like, yep. Pick this out because we talk later with David about his new book, Lessons Learned on the Run. He's very um, focused in on not just running, but this physical idea of your body in space and then the thoughts that come with it. This book came from running. It's about running. It's about thinking and moving. And so I thought this was a great proof here. It says it's 2017, and this is the first definitive you know, clinical example that your working memory is associated with your lifestyle choices, which I thought was interesting because it's always like, well, I trust, you know, some people can just eat steak and, you know, smoke and granny's still drunk right there and she's on the roof again and we got to get her down. She's healthy, you know, and she's as sharp as a tack, you know? So I think we have a little bit of cognitive biases when we approach lifestyle choices and brain activity. Yeah. Well, especially when it comes to doctors, you know, (laughs) they're not going to be like, you know, it turns out it's not all that bad. It turns out what's not all that bad. Smoking, smoking, drinking, <laughs> being on the Steak, roof, egg rolls yeah, for breakfast. Man. Oh, um, I had a, I, am, I actually I almost did that. I had egg rolls last night and I was like, you know, that might be kind of tasty right now. Anyway, sorry, but I digress. My hot take is I thought this was interesting because I had to look up the difference in between working memory and long-term memory. And they make a distinction here because long-term memory is like a filing cabinet. And those are the things that's like you give the analog of a computer or or like a filing cabinet. You pull out something and you think about it. Working memory is the way your brain puts itself together to create your state of mind that works on current problems. So I think we have it confused that our brain is just a repository that we pull things out of and then act on them, when in reality, there's a couple different versions of memory. One is this long-term thing where we remember, and the other one is the way our brain uses memory in the current, right now, here moment which I thought was an interesting dichotomy because it hints on the idea of changing your brain isn't just up to the idea of, can't you remember history, you dummy? You did this before. Why don't you change the way you think? And everyone gets frustrated. And in reality, 
drilling yourself on history and making yourself repeat these bad memories that you have isn't the way to change the way you make decisions. You have to focus on changing your working memory, which can be benefited from changing your lifestyle choices, which can come from just working out, increasing your cardiovascular health. It just feels so simplistic as to just be laughable. But do you hear what I'm, do you hear what I'm saying? I mean, like, it's like the keys to fixing this are here, but it's actually in your body that can fix your mind. I mean, am I hitting on this? Are you confused? No. Y- yes, you're hitting on it. No, I'm not confused. I just, I had, I had kind of a different feeling on this, but I, I, it's, it's an amazing thought when you, when you really get down to how your brain is actually like building synapses right. and, and making these correlations. Right. Um, I, I don't know that people really slow down and consider that very often because mm-hmm. it just happens. You know, yeah, you it's think like you breathing. know better. Why don't you know better? You, your yeah. brain. What I really dug about this article, what hit me right away, though, was um, higher physical. It says they found that cohesiveness in the working memory brain map is possibly associated with higher physical endurance and better cognitive function, right? So there's something there when we talk to Dave later and he's talking about going for a run and having these ideas or being able to kind of, you know, he calls them putting it in the crock pot, like stewing mm-hmm. on these things. Mm-hmm. What I'm starting to get to here is that it you're using a different part of your memory a different part of your brain you're not sitting there like you just said i mean like why can't i figure this out why can't i remember this thing it's because you're using a different path you're tapping into something else and i think there's something there and like you say you know i think there's some people who who tap into these areas in a different way you know unfortunately a lot of musicians you know use drugs or whatever Mm -hmm. but it's kind of the same thing. You know, when you, when you go running, particularly longer distances, it's a real mental game. There's a, obviously a physical aspect to it. But there's a mental aspect to finishing a marathon, to, yeah. to running a 10K or whatever. And I think there's something implied here that using that part of your head and working out things there kind of builds up this ability or reinforces this ability to kind of problem solve and work things out and recall Mm -hmm. in a different way. Exactly. And in different settings. It's interesting. All of the trial lawyers that I know are big on exercise. It may just be an, uh, an affluent thing too. You know, a lot of rich people going to the gym, gym's kind of expensive. Running's free. Physical, your body's worth it. Checking in, giving yourself this time to just sort of observe and reflect how can you get there? What Paul's saying is, is that your body is the way to get to your mind. And then you fix your mind that way, not with your mind fixing your mind. You know, I think we'll think our way out of it, but maybe we can feel our way out of it or, you know, sort of experience and, and sort of physically exert ourselves. And that it's weird. would be the, the, the mechanism, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Well, and and we talk about muscle memory a lot and you got to remember the brain is a muscle, you know, so there's a certain level. I just, I feel like there's some correlation. And I think this study is, is leaning that way too. When saying that you're, when you're, you're training, even though it may not feel like you're using your brain to get through, you know, set number three of your bench presses or whatever, there's still something going on there and using that same kind of system to mm-hmm. sort of work through some of these different things, that kind of working memory and that cognitive function. And it makes sense why it would be affected then by, by some of those, you know, different behaviors. Mm-hmm. The same yeah. way that doing something, I mean, it's like, duh, boozing it up and smoking, it's not good for your body. Well, you know, it's the same thing, right? Well, it's hard to tell if you're doing the right thing, but... What's exciting to hear from folks like David, you know, and from research like this is that it's just proven that if you don't move it, you're going to lose it. And I think that's with anything, moving your brain, your ambitions, your goal marks, your standards, you know, move them, you know, raise them, get, get off the couch in your brain or get off the actual couch in your yeah. apartment and you'll get the same kind of effects and benefits but you can learn these lessons here. Uh, you can learn them walking. You can learn them on Lossom. You can learn them on the run by getting David's book. Or you could just stay tuned and then hear the interview. And then we'll run you right through all the paces. 
All right. Here you go. On your marks. Get set. Get set. <laughs> Sorry. No, that was good. <laughs> and go. now you can say, go. Let's go. Lawson continues. But first, a word from our sponsor. The internet can be a cold and unforgiving place. Every day, thousands of law firm websites go unvisited and unfairly labeled as worthless due to the inattention or misguided attempts at do-it-yourself marketing by their owners. Poor optimization and bad design principles have left these sites unable to realize the full potential of the digital landscape they're forced to exist in, and they're now trapped on page three of the search results in an endless cycle of bad management, leading to poor results, leading to disillusionment and loss. There's hope for these neglected websites in the form of a digital marketing company focused exclusively on law firms. Since 1999, ConsultWebs has helped hundreds of lawyers connect to thousands of clients across the country using sound marketing principles based off an exhaustive track record of marketing campaigns that have already proven to be successful. If your website is underperforming, call ConsultWebs at 800-872-6590 and get the clicks it so desperately needs. Please don't let another day full of unvisited pages go by. Take that step and call today for them. And now, a lawsome interview. David Kempston has been running for over 40 years. A trial lawyer who loves to learn, this middle-of-the-pack runner has run with five different generations. Along the way, he's logged countless miles and learned that running is a great metaphor for life. His new book, Lessons Learned on the Run, distills his thoughts on running and life, and whether you're a runner, a lawyer, or neither, these stories will make you laugh, learn, and reflect. Here to talk about his new book, Sneaking into the Studios a Second Time, Dave Kempston, welcome to Lawsome. Thanks, fellas. Good to be back. It's nice to have you here. Um, so talk. We're in the elevator. Pitch us this book. Tell us a little bit about it. And then what, what compelled you to put the pen to the paper? In the present season of life, the message of this book is even more compelling than when I uh, managed to get it out of my head and onto paper. And, and what I mean by that is if we all remember back a few years ago, the ABA came out with that great study where they said, to be a healthy lawyer, you've got to be a happy lawyer. And by application, that applies to a much broader segment of society than just us lawyer types. So what I really am getting at in the book is is a happy place. And I'm not saying, okay, your happy place has to be running. That's not where I'm going with this, all right? But for me, running is a happy place. Uh, My wife has teased me horribly. Uh, It's not the greatest use of the word, but you get the idea. She has been vituperous in getting after me about my strange emotional connection to running. And I'm a trial lawyer. I've tried over 450 cases now, and I am fascinated with story. Um, That's what I do. I'm a storyteller. That's what I do professionally. And so I'm fascinated with people's stories. I'm fascinated with clients' stories. And over the years of running, I've collected a lot of stories. And the genesis for the book, since that was the question, if I was a witness, you fellas would have interrupted me, said, objection, Kempston, not nope, no, 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 we like that stuff. Move to strike, get there, boy, <laughs> answer the question. All right. So the genesis for the book was actually procrastination, all right? I was finishing up my lawyer book. I needed to get into the nitty gritty. And then all of it, and you know, this is how it works. You've got something you should be doing, but instead you're doing something else. So I have this brainstorm when I'm running. Just, it blows up in my head. Oh my gosh, Kempston, running is a metaphor for life. Think of all the things that you have learned over the years. I have run when the ambient temperature was minus 29 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not the wind chill. It was windy that day. I don't, I don't know what the wind chill made it. It was brutal. It was windy too. If you take my iPhone and you take the selfie I took and you live photo it, you can hear the wind going, whoosh, and it was 29 <laughs> below. That was the polar vortex. I've also run when it's 100 degrees and uber humid. So within that 129 degree Fahrenheit swing, you know, there's been a few different experiences. I've run 
in the dark. I've run in the light. I've run as a, you know, a 10 year old trying to keep up with my dad bawling because I ate ice cream cone before we went for a run. Now I'm a 52 year old. I push a grandkid in a stroller. There have been a lot of different experiences running. So it's not just a book where I barf my running stories on people, but there is practical wisdom. I have learned that running is an incredible life coach. She's a good teacher. And if you are willing to learn, then she's got much to teach you. So I, I'm trying to finish up my lawyer book. I have this, oh my gosh, this will be like a New York Times bestseller idea. Oh, yeah. So what that does is then it takes me down a rabbit hole for a while while I'm getting these ideas out. Because you know now that I'm in my 50s, I know that when those ideas come, if you don't immediately anchor them to a page or an email or an iPhone note, they will be gone. Yes, they sprout wings and fly away and they go hide with the socks in the dryer that we lose. That's True. Really yeah, the left socks. So anyway, this blew up in the middle of trying to finish up my running book. And then what I did was I just took all these ideas and I'd go on runs and I'd have, oh my gosh, yeah. And I'd pull out my iPhone and I'd be dictating in the dark, which is a sure way to trip, stumble, break something. But, and I ended up with this accordion folder of all of these disparate ideas that then I sat down like a high school thesis paper, college research paper, and put them in piles and coordinated it and, and put it together. So that, that was the long-winded version of how Dave's running book. <laughs> well, so thinking about uh, physical, um, you're saying in this moment, you know, um, physical movement, I think, is a part of humanity. And it's something in this culture specifically that a lot of people are averse to. Gym classes, you know, I mean, are just abandoned. I mean, those are one of the things that are cut in public schools. And you think there's sort of a dearth of ac action. And there's this connection here with physicality and thinking. Um, what advice do you have for people who maybe are inspired by this book, but they're not inspired enough to like get off the couch and stop eating Doritos. I mean, speak to physical connection here and then that connection to inspiration a little bit. All right. I will do that. That said, I want to give my little caveat, my disclaimer. I am a plaintiff lawyer and there's nothing I hate worse than a self-righteous plaintiff lawyer. So I don't want to come off as Mr. Self-Righteous Exercise Advocate. Right. I don't want to do that. That said, there's a great phrase, motion is lotion. And there's truth to that. And there is benefit from physical activity. William Wordsworth, and you may not be into romantic poetry, but in my younger years when I studied English literature, read about William's word, William Wordsworth, and he would compose poetry when he walked. And I don't know if the iambic pentameter matched his pace, but that was something that stirred him, stirred his creative juices to compose poetry. Steve Jobs at Apple was famous for the power walk with the creative minds, and they would right. go on walks, and they would right. talk. And so there is this idea that as we are moving, it's you know, I mean, yeah, we're burning calories, and but it's more than that. There's a synergy. There's a creativity that can be loosed. There's another saying. So I said motion is lotion. All right, well, here's another one for you. Move it or lose it. Right, All right, right, I'm now 52, and I can tell you that I can't move like I could when I was younger. And I'm noticing this not with each passing year, but with each few passing years, because I seem to age incrementally. You know, uh, Gretchen Rubin wrote a great book called Better Than Before. And in mm. it, she said, keeping up is easier than catching up. And there's truth to that with physical activity. So if someone is not very active, my encouragement would be be active because you're going to loosen a number of chemicals into your body. And, and I was an English major, so I don't want to go too biochemist on you here because that would be inappropriate. Thank you. But there's a different makeup that happens. And when you talk about creativity, I actually wrote a chapter about this in my book. Some of my best creativity comes about when I am running. And it's interesting. I used to ride a bike. There, I've, I've had these seasons of self-inflicted injuries from running. <laughs> and I talk about that in my book you know, differentiating between good pain and bad pain and, you know, knowing when to quit 
trying to be a tough person and instead listen to your body and, and yeah. take the break you need. Oh, yeah. So there's a health, healthy balance there that I failed on many, many times in my life. But And as a result, I've had these seasons of injury. So one season of injury, I rode a bicycle a lot. And I found a similar experience with riding a bike, that there was that creativity on my longer bike rides. Then about two years ago, when I was you know, going to try out for the Olympics again, I was doing mile repeats and lo and behold, Dave hurt himself again. Surprise, surprise. Hurt my Achilles that time. So uh, I started walking a lot. Now, walking didn't have the same impact for me that running did. I find that on, a, on an easy run, the creativity really, really starts to stir for me. You know, like I said, I try a lot of cases. So and I've kind of got the trial prep down to an art in terms of how I do it, but getting the information into my head, I'm a firm believer that brains are like crackpots. So you load this stuff up. And then what you want to do is you need a reagent. You need something that's going to fire that crockpot and get it stirring. And I have found that easy runs do that for me. And my running buddy and I joke about that. We're like, well, is it, you know, is it the, the motion of running? Is it just like, it's that pounding. I mean, it's almost, you know, just pounding the plaque out of the arteries. Is it that rhythmic movement of the creative thoughts through the birth canal where they, you know, spring up from below? You know, is it the fact that your blood vessels are dilated? So you got more pure oxygen rolling into your brain or is it the endorphins that have taken over? You know, I don't get a runner's high every time I run. I mean, absolutely not. But it is there from time to time. But where I'm going with this is that if I've got to give a presentation or a talk, or if I'm working on how I'm going to do my opening argument, my closing argument, or how I want to cross-examine this witness or whatever, a lot of times it really gels for me on a run, with the exception of Thursdays. All right, today is a Thursday. <laughs> and Thursdays are my perceived hard days. And when I say perceived, what I mean by that is that it might not be hard to anybody else, but to a middle-aged pedestrian runner named Dave Kempston, I perceive them to be very difficult endeavors. On those days, the only thought that's going through my mind is, oh, Lord, please help me finish this. <clears throat> Actually, I wrote a chapter about this in the book called The Governor. And I don't know if y'all have ever run into The Governor, but it's that you know, in the old days, cars had a governor on them, a regulator that controlled how fast they could go. And so you'd get your car up to top speed and it would just, uh, you know, it, and well, not that it would stall out, but it just wouldn't go any faster. Interesting. Interesting. Well, our brains are equipped with those too. So when you take your body out and you think, well, I'm going to just, I'm going to flatline you. We're going to see what you can do today. At some point, you know, you begin to have this conversation with yourself because it's your brain. It's that preservation part of your brain that's right. taken over. Okay. Right. And it's saying, oh my goodness, this hurts. And then, you know, the conversation becomes, Dave, you're 52, uh, brother. You don't <laughs> need to be out here doing this. Uh, Dave, you got a long day. Dave, you need to be in trouble. Dave, you know, if you run really hard, your, your exercise-induced asthma is going to kick in and you're going to be coughing in court all afternoon. Dave, no one is watching you. No one will care if you quit. So on Thursdays, that's the only kind of thought process that goes down in my brain. Otherwise, I find running to be remarkably creative. <laughs> <laughs> the governor's not showing up. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's a that's a tough part of it. I mean, it's it's difficult, you know, especially when you're doing something where you you know you're pretty much by yourself. When you're running, you're running against the clock and yourself. It's not necessarily, you know, let's all team up and and win this race together. Right, so it's like sa it's like uh it's like music and metronomes. You know, I yeah, I don't need to pay attention to the metronome. I don't need to. <laughs> who's really paying attention to me running this scale? Um, we can flub it, yeah. but then. Then you realize once you're in the orchestra pit and they want you to hit that line and you're like, oh, man, I really yeah. should have, uh, you know, rocked with the governor, you know. Well, I, I want to kind of pick up this thread a little bit, though, because it's interesting. Something uh, I've been I've been very interested in and, and kind of practicing for a long time is like walking meditation. Mm. Um, there's lots of books out on it and stuff like that. But I, I think there's definitely something to some kind of physical activity, like a, a, almost like the Zen of the trail that you just kind of fall into that, that sort of, once you train yourself to it, you get into that creative state. And I'm kind of curious, what advice kind of do you have to sort of build on that? And particularly the reflective aspect of it. A lot of people, like we were talking earlier and you say you get an idea, you know, you got to stop and write it down. And I know I'm the same way, like it's like a dragonfly zipping by. And if I don't grab it, but then is there anything to the idea of, of like you were saying, like stewing on it? Do you have like a guideline or is there anything there 
that helps you be more productive kind of through that reflection and letting it kind of build on itself in your brain a little while in that crock pot? Yeah, great question. So before I, I get at the meat of it, I as I was thinking about this one day, you know, runners always talk about long, slow distance runs, right? Well, what's the acronym for that, fellas? LSD. Now there's all. <laughs> if you want to deep dive into the internet, hey, go check out on the creative theories behind LSD. <laughs> there you go. I don't want to push that one too hard, but anyway. <laughs> Dave, that's a different show, Dave. <laughs> We're ready for it. We're yeah. totally. <laughs> we just need so some time. I, I think you know the answer is. I mean, it depends on what you're getting at. Mm. You know, initial drafts of anything are never that good. I think that. You know, if we're talking about a musician, I can you know, speak to writing. <laughs> Your first draft is garbage, usually, and it requires refinement. Now, okay, this gets at something that I talked about in my lawyer book, and that is, you know, who's your audience? I mean, if, if I'm composing an email to a client, I need to understand what they were asking me and respond to it. You know, if I'm writing a letter to another lawyer, if it's a filing letter, it just depends on what you're doing what level you want to go at. But that idea of letting things simmer before, you know, letting it simmer, setting it aside. You know, when I was in college, I wrote a lot of papers and it was terrible because by and large, I would wait until the day before they were due and I would stay up all night and crank them out. And I think that's what a lot of English majors did. And, you know, and then as a younger attorney, I would do that with briefs. And at some point I realized, no, 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 no. And so if you if you put something down and then let it sit for a while and come back to it, not only are you going to notice you know, the grammatical issues, but you're also going to see where there's gaps in the logic or there's gaps in the reasoning or where your argument is missing or where you can bring another element to bear, especially if you're presenting an argument or you're presenting a theme. So I realize, you know, there are some works of art that are truly spontaneous explosions that don't need a lot of recrafting. Uh, you read about songwriters that the idea hits them and they sit down and boom, they got a they got a song in 45 minutes. Right. You know, William Faulkner, as I lay dying, supposedly he cranked that thing out in a, you know, I don't know if it was a week's couple of weeks. But well, didn't Mary there. Shelley, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein in like a weekend or something kind of that's insane what, like that? Yeah. That's what they say. So there's always going to be an exception, but I know that for me, uh, there's deep creativity that comes about through this process. Now getting to how's that going to work for someone else? Okay. Well, I think we got to go back to something I said a while ago, you know, running is my happy place. Well, what does that mean? Okay, that's a cute saying, Dave, and you know it, it means something different to everybody else. Well, it's something I've done for a very long time. I have a lot of muscle memory with, and I don't mean I'm a strong guy. I simply mean that my body knows what it feels like to run. It's a very familiar place for me. I've spent a lot of time there. And so I wonder if there's a relaxation that happens if I'm not on a Thursday <laughs> where... <laughs> it's conducive to that. So someone else might say, oh, I'm going to start walking. And the first time they walk, you know, they're very aware of their environment. So they're maybe overwhelmed by the environment as opposed to having this deep creative thought process. And I'm just thinking out loud here, which is always dangerous. So forgive me. But <laughs> you know, it could be that as you do it more and more and it becomes second nature to you, you know, that combined with the physical, whatever the chemicals are doing in your body that enhances the creative process. So yes. if you're looking to have this epiphanal burst, you know, and you haven't run before and you're going to go for a two mile run, um, you're probably not going to have an epiphanal burst on that first one. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think what we're kind of getting to here is that we're, we're, whether it's, and I think you made a great point too, where it's for you, it's running, but it could be any, it could be walking, it could be anything, but doing something with your body, it's almost like you're giving your body something to do. So you can just kind of dream and it sort of helps it build into, you know, like here, all right, you, since, since busy brain, you got to work on something here, you work on this seven minute mile and I'm just going to wander off here and dream. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. When my, I have four children and when they were younger, we would snowboard a lot together. There's a, it's funny, you know, Minnesota is relatively flat. So, but we have a great park 
called Highland Hills. And I run there in the, in the summer, been running there this spring and it's pretty hilly. It's rough. You go back off on the terrain and, you know, when my buddy and I ran nine miles last uh, Saturday and I think we climbed 800 feet in nine miles. That's, that's decent climbing on trails, but it, it's not super mountainous. It's not Colorado, but I, I used to take the kids snowboarding there because it's really close to my house and we could swing by after work or something. And I found that I always used to say, you know, that snowboarding was cheaper than a psychiatrist. And then the same is true with running because I found that after a hard day, getting outside in the air, there's a fresh air component to that, redeeming the lousy Minnesota winter weather, you know, snowboarding, spending time with my kids, and then having that hard edge. If you've ever snowboarded, it's all about the edge of your board. Once you lose the edge, you got issues. But in Minnesota, we have what's called Minnesota hard pack. So when you are snowboarding at night in February and it's five below, the sound that you'll hear will be, and it's that edge on the ice, just, just taking away the day's anxiety. And, you know, the same is true with running in, in a different way. But, yeah, you know, I run outside all year round and I have a lot of friends that are treadmillers and, you know, they're like, why do you run outside in the winter? Don't you? Yes, you're going to fall. I don't care how careful you are. You're going to go down. But that said, I've learned that when you live when you live in a cold weather climate, I spend all day under fluorescent lights wearing a suit. I'm a trial lawyer. I mean, get me outside as much <laughs> as you can. So well, to double great, down, great to think about that, uh, to think about what you do during the day and needing an escape, lawyers, um, getting back to words. I, I, I did a uh, creative fiction writing class when I lived in New York, and it was funny because some of the people there, one of them was a grant writer, one of them um, I think was a, a law student, but they really expressed a lot of frustration having to be professionally engaged with words and then having that sap their joy out of using words in, 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 in like for a book or for a story or just to have fun with them. And I mean, you're, you're a literature guy, so you already have this sort of romance, but just, can you kind of speak to maybe the idea of lawyers just being tired with dealing with words professionally that they don't care to think of them in a romantic way, and then maybe bring that into their practice a little bit? I would get at that by first saying, you know, a wordsmith who I really admire and enjoy was, is Winston Churchill. Mm. And I'm listening to William Manchester's biography. It's in three parts and I'm listening to it on Audible and it's, it's nice. the third narrative. It's in three different volumes. And the third one is a different, wonderful British voice than the first two. But Churchill was just unbelievable in terms of his wordsmithing. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that he did was he wrote a wonderful book that was published in the 60s called Painting as a Pastime. Hmm. And it's a collection of his oil paintings. And then he's, he talks about them. And, and he was a man who says that in order to be really happy, a person needs to have two or three hobbies that are genuine. And it's funny because in the book, he then goes on to say, and I'm not talking about going for a walk. So in some ways, he undercuts my theory. But then again, Winston, you know, from what I've learned about him, he wasn't overly active after a certain age. Right. In life. So he may, he may have been ignorant about the point, but the idea that he gets at is that for a strained mind, you need to have a change because he goes on to say that a change is as good as a rest. So if we take that to people who write all day and work with words all day, but do so in a professional context and then switch it up and say, no, you're going to do this for fun or you're going to do this because it's in your head and it needs to come out. You know, people are like, Kempston, why do you write books? I mean, don't you have enough to do? And it's like, <laughs> yeah, um, but they're there and they need to come out. And I'm not saying there's a third one, uh, but I'm with the last two, they've been there. And it's like, oh, it's not going away. I just got to get it out. Yeah. So a change is as good as a rest. And that's that. one of the reasons I advocate running or walking but and snowboarding. It's not just, oh, just run. Have your life be about running. Gosh, no. <laughs> Have a panoply of things that you like to do. Mm -hmm. And so getting back to words, you know, the more you read, you want to be a writer, read. Read how other people write. Don't just read the same stuff. Read a variety. Here we go. Be eclectic. 
in your reading. Yeah, you might learn something. So someone who's stuck in an office all day, a scrivener, a modern day scrivener. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <They're>, right. <laughs> Come on. Indeed. You know, they can still have an outlet writing for fun or writing because they have to or because they're compulsed by themselves. And I think that's the answer to that question. Yeah. I mean, you know what? And it's it's real easy to do. I love that what you're saying about how it has to like it's there. Like, I got to get this out. It's not part of it isn't even really a choice. For but you real. know, it's fun yeah. just to check it out. If you want to test your thing, there's all kinds of like random sentence generators. You can just go online, look up random sentence generator or whatever. It's a writing prompt. Oh, Boom, finger go. exercises. Yeah, yep. I've I've yeah, done exactly. those before. Just just sort of interesting cues. Um, yeah, well, but because I, you have to develop that muscle memory. Oh my you know gosh! I mean? Well, creativity and, is the same way. But the crockpot thing is genius. Yeah, and yeah, I think yeah. Dave's I really hitting on something that, like, what I'm sort of experiencing is that why don't people do better if they know better? <laughs> and, and of course, you probably can take however you. Well, I mean, why don't they? But the truth is, is that you don't let things stew enough and reflect enough and you don't put it in the crock pot enough with enough time ahead to maybe see if it's going to work out. I mean, us marketing people, we know let's get this stuff ahead of time so we can take a look at the grammar before we release it. And, you know, let's you know, we can test it. And we're really obsessive about that. But a lot of people just want to, you know, fire off the ideas. And I. It's just an interesting concept of why don't we reflect? Running gives you the instant place to do that, even if you aren't even planning on it. Sort of rather than sitting down and meditating, okay, I'm going to meditate or okay, I'm going to go and, you know, solve a problem. I think, you know, the idea of just escaping to connect. What did you say earlier, Dave? What was the some kind of escapism to connect back to the idea? Yeah, I I mean, getting out there and engaging with the elements and having your brain, it's almost like watching something out of your periphery where you know it's there, but you're not focused on it. So on the writing thought, here's a great line just to keep in mind. And it's true with music. You'd better be brutal with your own writing because everyone else will be. And, you know, we live in an instant age. We live in an age where people expect Hey, I'm going to write a book and it's going to be a New York Times bestseller. Hey, I'm going to put out a song and it's going to be TikTok you know, and Twitter. Uh, oh, it's going to be amazing. And sure, there are those people who have instant success. There are those flash in the pans. But for most of us, and I don't think I'm a good writer. <clears throat> I read someone who's a good writer and I'm like, wow, this, <laughs> this person can really write. Sure, you know? sure, yeah. I'm struggling to get through it. And yet it's also the development of an artist. You know, I mean, think of someone looking at a Picasso painting and going, I could do that. And you're like, well, yeah, but that's not where he started. Go look at the evolution of this artist as he found his artistic voice. And you see that with writers. One of the, the most gratifying pieces of feedback I got on my running book was from a lawyer here in town who does a lot of mediations. And he sent me an email. He says, hey, I'm about halfway through your running book. I'm really enjoying it. He says, you're progressing as a writer. And this guy reads a lot. And I thought, wow. You know, instead of saying, oh, that was a cute story and that made me laugh. And, Gee, I never thought of that idea. Right, Great right. quotes. Right. And stuff. I go, dude, you either um, had a really good quote book available or you read a lot of stuff. <laughs> like, well, yeah, I read a lot of stuff. <laughs> right. Sorry. I wasn't just pulling out the quote book and dropping it. You know, this one fits. Let's uh, build a chapter around this quote. Well, um, nice. You know, what's, what, what's to your point, what's so funny is the only people coming up to you after a gig telling you you did a good job are musicians. They're saying, man, you did great. You're like, oh, cool. They're like, yeah, I played oboe in the city, you know, <laughs> municipal marching band, you know, as community service for crimes. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. <laughs> True story. As, as you do these things, it's, it's like running. Um, you begin to find a voice. And I write as part of my job. I write all the time. But a lawyer writing voice, you know, there's the email to the client, there's pro forma documents. There's a brief that you put a lot of effort into. There's a written closing argument. There's motions. There's mm -hmm. something, you know, whatever. <laughs> but when you write to tell stories, that's a different voice. And it isn't natural necessarily. And 
and it does develop and change over time. And we see that when we when someone has a large body of work that we can look at, whether it's musical or painting or writing, mm -hmm. you see, hopefully you see a progression. Hopefully they're not getting worse. You know, that, with running, that's what happens as we watch, you know, you look at the body of work from, you know, when I was 10 to when I'm 52. And well, yeah, and it's also the tools you're working with. You know, they're yeah. not, I mean, those yeah. tools aren't, you know, <laughs> the brain's yeah. still there though, you know. Oh, Margaret George is one of my favorite historical uh, novelists, and she uh, has written a bunch of great books. And one of them uh, she wrote was on Queen Elizabeth, the, the first one. And in there, uh, the queen's cousin, Lady Letitia, has a wonderful quote. And Lady Letitia says, this is a great quote, things change if you have the privilege of living long enough. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> yes. 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 I'll That's run with that. We That's can good. run with Absolutely. that. My, That's good to keep in mind. How can people learn more about you and how can they get your book? I'm a boring guy, so they probably don't want to learn more about me. But if they're terribly interested, you can check me out on Twitter or LinkedIn or my Instagram account. This morning on my run, there was a snapping turtle, so I took a really cool. Oh yeah! Right. They, things are things are getting a little snappy on my run. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or if you just Google my name, David Kempston, books, Amazon, that'll lead you to page and lessons learned on the run is a book about running in life and it's available kindle and print or if um, you're interested wrote another book that we talked about about a year and a half ago called um, that's why they call it practicing law and it's even though it's kind of aimed at lawyers and i've been teased by my son that i you know that i blew the marketing angle because it's really a customer service book it's really about relationship taking care of the the client i I try to follow the advice that was given to William Faulkner when he was younger, and that is after he wrote a couple of lousy novels, someone said, look, write what you know about. And so he came, <laughs> up, he came up with Yachna Patafa County, and lo and behold, you know, it, things turned out well for him after that. So writing about things I know about, um, you can find me on Amazon, and uh, there you go, fellas. Five questions we ask everyone. What was the last book you read? The last book I read would be... Uh, William Manchester's the, the Last Lion. Number two, what is your favorite place? My favorite place? Ooh, probably Highland Hills. Number three, what sites, blogs, newsletters, or podcasts do you regularly check in with? I follow my wife on Twitter regularly. Other than that, I'm pretty eclectic, although I've been very depressed lately with all of the news because there's got to be some good news out there, people, and no one wants to report it. <laughs> oh, man. There's there's one. I think it's called Uplifting News or something like that. There's one that they just they're constantly like posting in there about how crops are doing better and stuff like that. I'll see. I got to drop a link to that. But yeah, <laughs> I agree with you, man. It's tough to find the good stuff lately. OK, number four. If you were stranded on a desert island and could only pick one condiment to take with you, what would it be? Oh, we know the answer, gentlemen. I'm a mustard man all the way. Mustard oh, man. Boy. Enlisted. Okay, so then, so now, so we, we get that answer a lot. Um, mustard is a very popular condiment. So we need to we need to get a little more specific. Are we talking straight up yellow mustard? Are you like a Dijon guy or... Yeah, I live in a flyover state. What do you think, man? I'm a straight up just regular. <laughs> <laughs> That's all they got there. It's just oh Frenches. It's okay. Fine. After a long day or a long week at work, how do you relax and unwind? I love to go on walks after work. I tend to run in the morning or if it's in the winter, I do like to snowboard, although... I haven't snowboarded as much as my children have aged because it's no fun to go play by yourself on the hill. Yeah. You, you need to have somebody to help you <laughs> with. For show notes, links, and info, go to thelawsonpodcast.com or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Be sure to leave us a review and rating in iTunes or wherever you find the p you listen to. Until next week, stay Lawson. Awesome.